What's up, Mob Crew? I'm Chris. And today, today's missing person case is Don. Also, today's person of interest is Olivia. Today's missing person case is Bob. Also, today's missing person case is Corey. What's up, Mob Crew? Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you guys can hear me okay, please put a one in the chat. <clears throat> Good to see everybody. Uh, let me get this started there. All right. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I am Chris with Monsters Under Our Bed. I cover murder, mystery to the paranormal. And today we're going to be covering uh, the Alex Murdoch trial. Uh, we got some more control tests courtesy of steve from true crime web so please um go and show some love to his channel and subscribe if you haven't already um he's just done amazing work um every week he's putting out a uh, new control test and uh they've been amazing so um all right thank you so much for putting ones in the chat you guys can hear me okay that's awesome so before we introduce the co-host for today, we always like to get back by featuring the missing. So let me get my screen ready here. Uh, let's see. There we go. Perfect. Okay. And bring this over. So we'll, if you're new to the channel, we always try to get back by featuring the missing at the start of every show. Uh, today we have Sarah Stewart. She went missing on February 12th, so just over a week ago, uh, near Power and McDowell Road. This is in uh, Mesa, Arizona. Just 26 years old, 5'1", uh, brown eyes, brown hair, multiple tattoos on her shoulder blade, forearm, and, uh, and on her upper chest. She was last seen wearing black sweatshirts and black sweatpants, a uh, Nightmare Before Christmas logo on it. Uh, it says down in the notes, uh, she has a white 2017 Buick uh, Verano, and it says she has not been heard from since Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday. Um, let's see, anything else on there? So... If you have any tips, please call 602-876-1011. All right. And we've got one more. And we have uh, Austin Madsen, who went missing, sadly, on January 27th uh, in kind of the southern er uh, southern part of Utah, kind of uh, north of Bryce Canyon area in Garfield County. Um he is 6'2", skinny build, hazel eyes, longish brown hair. Uh, he was out there doing some snowshoeing and uh, some hiking, and uh, he was in contact with some family and friends, and then unfortunately uh, they didn't hear from him uh, since the 27th, and um, this is the area he kind of went missing in. This is uh, kind of southern Utah. The circle here is kind of the area. It's, uh, it's called Black Canyon is where they last saw his truck and, or where they found his truck, excuse me, and where his uh, footprints, they kind of tracked him for a bit and then lost him. Uh, he did make a note um, that he was going to possibly be heading south to Kanab or Arizona, but I don't know if he made it that far. So, uh, 
Uh, if you have any tips, please call 801-682-5675. That is Austin Madsen missing out of Southern Utah. All right. Uh, mods, let me know how the chat speed is. I've got it kind of set at a low number since I think StreamYard doubles it um, or YouTube doubles it when I have StreamYard on. So uh, if it's slow or fast, just let me know. And we'll go ahead and introduce our co-host for today. Hey, Steve, how you doing, buddy? Doing fine, sir. How are you? Good, buddy. Um, honor is always to have you on and just can't thank you enough for all the amazing control tests you've done. Uh, and you've got another one today. Uh, but before we talk about that, um, for those that might be new to the channel and you're, yourself, you want to give just a little bit about your background? Uh, sure. I'm a uh, uh, retired law enforcement, had 20 years of service um, and um, started off in the uh, uh, working in the jail, went to road and went into investigations, became a state certified crime scene investigator and which helped my investigative career, of course, and uh, handled all different types of cases from uh, uh, minor cases up to homicide. And after I retired, I uh, decided to become an ambassador for law enforcement and on the YouTube channel and uh, with the web sluice and that's what's brought us here uh today yeah and you have just been uh crushing it out of the park recently and uh just uh, amazing and um well so, yeah have done it without you for the fact that i'm up there uh, working and uh, uh, setting up everything because it takes a while to set up the scenes and then i send you the stuff and uh your creative abilities to to make it where it makes sense and flows uh well um, is a little bit better than what my uh, skill sets are. And I thank you for assisting and helping me. Yeah, likewise, buddy. Uh, Rock and Dawkins, uh, what constitute reasonable is decision by the jury. So true. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it all comes down to what the jury thinks. And it's it's going to be tough because uh, even though I'm, in my opinion, he's guilty or I think he's guilty um, and there's a lot. Uh, just because he's there minutes before uh, the shootings happen. But it's not like they have that smoking gun. They don't have, you know, uh, the weapon, you know, the uh, just that one thing that, you know, solidifies everything. They've just got, you know, that, that's that video, which is, you know, pretty uh, damning, but at the same time, is it enough? Um, it's a circumstantial case mm -hmm. all the way. So true. All right. Well, it's like I said, Steve's been busy again. Uh, so I hope you guys are excited for his new little control test he did. Uh, I think some people. Okay. Uh, Chris, Steve is a bit quieter than you. Do you need Steve to turn up or do you need me to go down? Can you turn yours up at all anymore? I think I'm at like 97% right now. Okay. Can you just hit 100 I think that should be good. I'll turn mine just a tad down. There is a little bit. He does have a different mic. Uh, so, but I'm going to get the video ready while he's uh, adjusting that. I mean, you sound good. I, I don't think it's too much of a big difference. Let me know in chat, though. So, as I'm getting the video ready, uh, Steve, because I think a lot of people don't realize how fast uh, when it comes to, and I have to be careful using red rum. Uh, but how fast that happens, uh, it's, you know, usually these kind of things are over pretty quickly. Um, just like in the Brian, uh, you know, the Idaho student case with Brian, uh, a lot of people don't, couldn't wrap their heads. Well, some people couldn't wrap their heads around it happening in just a few minutes with, you know, just a knife. But uh, according to your expertise and, you know, your experience, uh, usually that stuff happens. It's over pretty quickly. Absolutely, it is. Um, and, um, you know, anytime in close quarter battles, people fighting for their lives um, is extremely uh, uh, volatile and dynamic and fluid. And a lot of things happen really quick. It's not uh, like you see on uh, TV where they're able to slow it down to slow motion. It's, that's just not the way it is in life and death situations. Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, we'll start the video. The first part of it is I just kind of 
snipped in uh, just for those. I, I think most of you guys know the timeline, but for those that may not know this case, I just threw uh, the first kind of part of my video in just to kind of lead it into um, what Steve did. And basically what Steve did is to show kind of how fast you could take out two people. Um, and this does not reflect exactly what happened, but it's just to show how fast it can go down. And I, I think it's, you know, it's a great test to show how fast uh, it can be over with. Maggie went to the kennels using one of the ATV slash side-by-sides. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn this down and just kind of uh, narrate myself here. But uh, so uh, the timeline, you know, we have from 12 to uh, 6, well, 6 o'clock approximately, you know, Alex is at work, leaves work about... Uh, 620 gets home i think 640 paul then arrives shortly after then they go riding around for about an hour and then maggie shows up at approximately 817 uh they must have ate dinner pretty quickly like as soon as she arrived and then of course according to alex's alibi he says he goes to take a nap says he's watching a little bit of tv and says he's on the phone for a little bit but uh all those things can't be true because his phone was supposedly off by 809 suspiciously. And uh, anyway, the I think the most likely scenario is the timeline is Paul, Maggie, and Alex uh, go to the kennels sometime after around 830 or a little after. Um, it's possible they could have taken the side-by-sides. One thing I is also possible is they could have taken maybe a side-by-side -side in Paul's truck or just went in Paul's truck. There's a couple of different scenarios on that. Um, but anyway, as we move forward here, I'm going to go ahead and play this. Mysteriously show no activity between 8.09 until 9.02. And this is something that I we got to go back on, Steve, uh, victimology and uh, habits of, you know, the people surrounding these types of events. Is this something that Alex normally does? shuts his phone off for an hour. Uh, somebody that's known for uh, being on the phone all the time. Is that normal for him to turn off his phone? You know, so we'll, we'll come back to that though. That's one of my big questions. Meaning he most likely shut it off just after Maggie arrived at the house, which means he was getting ready to execute his plan. Maggie, Paul, and Alex would leave for the kennels on one of the ATV slash side-by-sides sometime around 8.30 p.m. And during this time, both Paul and Maggie would be active on their phones. While at the kennels, Paul would have a four-minute call with his good friend Rogan, and they would talk about Rogan's dog, Cash, friend, and would read his last message at 8.48 and 59 seconds. At approximately 8.49, Paul, at this moment, was in the feed. Okay, so here we go. So we got the scene set up here, <clears throat> which you did the best you could. Now, you've got the bodies. Um, I can see you've got Paul's body at the bottom. Let me see if this uh, – oh, that kind of blocks us. Oh, maybe I'll switch it back and forth as we go here, but – on the bottom left there, uh, it's, it's kind of hard because he's kind of in the camo suit, but you've got one mannequin down and you've got another mannequin in the top here. That's to uh, replicate uh, Maggie at the top and then, of course, Paul's body at the bottom, right? And they're approximately 32 and a half feet away, correct? Yes, uh, from head to head. Uh, I set it up last week when we did uh, that video of the um, uh, tracking the uh, shell casings to show the positions. And then I'm, I went and reset it up again for this uh, continuation. Yeah. So you've got uh, basically the scene set up. And then where you've got your caution tape would be kind of where the red overhang is, uh, you know, the edge of it. So that that uh, caution tape is really kind of like uh, the edge of yes, the uh, over. The best I could use from, from seeing the uh, measurements that was in there um, not to scale. <laughs> A diagram sure. that the uh, CSI, CSI they had certain measure, measurements in there uh, showing uh, distances between the uh, dog kennels and the uh, um, the shed and those distances are known and that's what this represents as close as I could get and um, so um, yeah that's about what the passageway would have been through there and um, 
and I put the um, these representations of the victims as close as I could. Okay. All right. So we've got the time. So now this is, uh, he's just shown in this te uh, control test how fast uh, this could have went down. Now this, now is this exactly how it went down? Like as far as time wise, probably not, but this just kind of shows uh, how fast things can go down. So we're going to go ahead and play it. And so right there, Paul is done. It's already 15 seconds in. Um, I'm assuming even that would have been pretty uh, almost accurate as far as time-wise. I mean, it, that would have been probably over pretty quickly, just Paul's scenario. Um, from looking at the blood trail inside the room as it comes across, it appears that all the, uh, the, uh, the blood trail is evenly spaced, it's constant, it's consistent, so it shows solid in movement there was very little of hesitation during that blood trail um, and then of course when it gets to the door and the uh, second and fatal shot occurs then of course there's massive uh, 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 blood uh, from both the gunshot wound and of course uh, as he lied uh, on the uh, concrete surface uh, whatever the natural um, bleed out would have been that would have gathered in that area okay all right, so we keep going now. Uh, so this is kind of to replicate if the guns were sitting in the side by side over just under the red overhang here. Yes. Um, and you switch to blackout and already, bam! Maggie shot twice, or actually shot once, but two fires shot. And this represents going into the chicken or the bird cage. Yeah. And those three shots. Now, of course, that probably is not exactly how it went down. He's just showing how fast things could go with two people uh, when they can't defend themselves. And that was 37 seconds uh, flat um, that you uh, took out two, uh, two people. That's It's crazy how fast uh, things can go down. So and to I'm me, to running, kind of, I'm, I'm running probably half, you know, half speed of what some of the. Uh, uh, but uh, Alex and I are uh, approximately saying, I think I'm four years older. I'm 60 years old now. And so, uh, uh, and of course, handling firearms, you have to be safe. And uh, was the offender moving faster or slower? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. So to kind of re replicate a little bit more accurate uh, version, and of course we we're never going to know exactly how uh, it went down. Uh, I, to me, in my opinion, I think the timeline of uh, the shootings happened between eight forty nine to eight fifty three, basically three to four minutes. Uh, but it looks like this could have been over even quicker, uh, minute to two tops. Uh, but here was even when I slow you down. I can barely even get it close to a minute when I slow you down here. So we'll play it one more time and we'll kind of discuss it here. Hard for old man to get up. <laughs> uh, yeah, give a shout out to Steve for doing that. That's so amazing. And like I said, I've got this slowed down and it doesn't even look like it. The last one I had you at 37 seconds, and even when I slow it down, that this was uh, over oops, by process, um, still was under a minute. And like I said, this is no, you know, exact recreation as far as time goes, but it's just it's just to show how fast, uh, you know, it, it can go down. Because I think people, even I, couldn't even fathom how fast, um, you know, these types of things go down. And yet, from your experience, you you know, like you yeah. said, it they're over pretty quickly 
Yes, I mean, you know, you're fighting for, uh, uh, you know, uh, the victims are fighting for their lives and um, and they're trying to do everything, even from flight and fight. Um, and um, if, as they do that, you know, um, it does take up some time, but it's not as much as um, now for the person involved in that time <laughs> period, uh, time does slow down because your your uh, uh, mental capacity, I mean, it's running a thousand mile an hour and it feels like, and people have been there. You, you, you think about uh, when it's going on with you. You have this tunnel vision, and you feel like you're moving in slow motion. Yes. That's just due to that you're processing everything so quick. Um, uh, you know, ever everything in your brain is clicking on all cylinders, and you're trying to figure out how to survive this thing. And um, so, uh, as this went on, the people involved in it, uh, it would seem uh, like a longer time period, but it would have been something representative of this. Sure. So it, it would have been over pretty quickly. I'm sure not 37 seconds, but it's just kind of an example of how how fast it, it, it could go down, um, yes. especially well, if you, it went down pretty close, pretty quick. I, yeah. I don't think there was any long struggles or because uh, 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 there would have been a, a, a longer flight trail or fight uh, trail. Uh, and um, um, and we don't have that. We have two clusters of, <laughs> of, of shell casings. Mm -hmm. And so those two encounters and the uh, trail of uh, casings tell a story and it doesn't take long to fire six shots. Uh, then That's it doesn't crazy. take long to fire the two shots for Paul either. Right. Right. Uh, amazing. Uh, and we, we've got some more uh, stuff that we're going to look at um, a little bit. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll keep it going here. There's tons of little tidbits that uh, I, I wanted to get Steve's uh, opinion on and, uh, and then also, uh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and play it, and then we'll get to it here. Eight fifty-three. As Maggie's phone would be handled at approximately eight fifty-three and fifteen seconds until eight fifty-five and thirty-two seconds, where it records fifty-nine steps. And at eight fifty-four and fifty-four seconds, the camera on the iPhone would activate for one second because the phone sees a face, but it doesn't unlock, meaning that the shooter who most likely is Alex, is handling her phone. At 8.55 and 52 seconds, her phone has one more orientation change than is most likely put away in a pocket. It's unclear what happens next, but going off data from the cell phone and SUV data, I will put together the most likely scenario. So knowing that the shooter... Okay, so this is uh, the next part we're going to, because now I've got you here, explain what he would most likely be in kind of uh, covered with as far as if he was the shooter. And I'm going to quickly grab this. Amy Lawler, uh, how did the tire mark get on her leg? That's a good question. Now, defense, I can't remember, is it the defense wants to say that it's a shoe print? The prosecution says it could be um, the ATV, right? I think each, yes, each side is arguing. You know, there's uh, in the CSI world, a lot of the uh, shoe print experts are also tire uh, uh, impression experts. And so, oh, really? Oh, okay. Yes. Makes, and makes so they sense. run uh, because they're all looking at uh, the same type of uh, rubber uh, characteristics. And um, oh, yeah, and that's so, all, right. And so uh, they're a lot of them cross training that, and um, we know from the prosecution that. They're going with that's a tire track from the ATV. The defense was mentioning shoe, and they have a shoe expert coming in. We just don't know which way that uh, uh, when the attorney mentioned shoe expert, is that really the way they're going to go with it, or are they going to go and that it is a tire print? Um, just don't know. Interesting. Okay, uh, we've got almost 2,000 people in here. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys are so amazing. Uh, if you can, please hit that like button uh, and uh, mods. Let me know if the chat is uh, good and uh, we'll continue on. So now this is kind of a show what kind of uh, high velocity blood spatter is kind of what we're going to look at. Because that's most likely what's going to get on uh, the shooter slash or Alex. Would be covered in blood spatter and gun. So this is what his shirt, I, I had to edit that out because YouTube has been kind of, they didn't like that, <laughs> that, <laughs> that part. Like no, they the didn't like that out. last time. Yes, I, I forgot I had to edit that out. But basically he has kind of a bag of fake blood. 
uh, that when I shot it, it creates a cloud that when you have this kinetic ener energy, that uh, when it makes contact with a human body, there is a, you have forward spatter and, and back spatter that occurs in the, uh, the world of blood spatter. And uh, blood spatter analysis, you look at those high velocity droplets. These larger drops here are not the high velocity droplets. That's just, whereas it was part of some of the uh, human tissue or the representation of the ballistic gelatin that went down range and created those. But if you see the little small dots that's in the background that you, you really can't see too much of them, but um, in this picture, it's a little dark. But if you brighten it up and enlarge it, you'll see that there's a lot of, uh, um, of these droplets are down to the size of a uh, straight pin, either the head and all the way down to the, uh, the size of what the sharp needle point of a straight pin is. I mean, they get extremely small. And um, you can analyze them, of course, and that's what in CSI you're looking for is that high velocity blood spatter because that tells you that um, the person that has a high velocity had to be within a short distance, just a few feet of being around that uh, victim um, uh, to uh, have this on their person. And the forward spatter, of course, goes a further distance, but the back spatter will still travel um, and as you can see with this pin, this little straight pin, you can see some of those droplets. Um, yeah. But um, but that back spatter will also come uh, backwards uh, towards the offender, and it gets on the firearm, it gets on the hands, the arms, the clothing, the shoes, and uh, because it just creates and goes in 360 um, and uh, creates this fine mist, and um, that's what we look for in CSI. Yeah. Um, so he... That would have definitely been on him for sure, uh, in the shooter. And, uh, yeah, these tiny little dots everywhere that are – even some of these are so minute, but these are the high-velocity uh, blowback that you would receive. And, of course, uh, from testing his clothing, he most likely changed. And that's what we're going to talk about next. And you even noticed something that I haven't really seen anybody else mention – uh, he was seen without a belt. Um, yes. Uh, we'll come back to this phone here. I'll, I should have put that towards the end, but um, we'll talk about Maggie's phone as well. And you even did a test um, to see if you could create that distance. But So here is his clothing. that uh, well, This was taken at 738, correct? Yeah, 738. And we have this uh, seafoam shirt the the housekeeper calls uh, khaki pants, and he's got the brown shoes on. And it's it's kind of a crappy detail, but uh, let's see if I can do this. Maybe we can see a little better. But uh, you notice he's actually got a belt on. Yep, you can only see it for one little frame. There comes up quick, but uh, yeah, you can clearly see there's a a, a belt. It's it's a little grainy. Um, but clearly that belt, uh, yeah, I noticed that when, uh, you were showing the interview, um, right there, uh, he didn't have a belt on. And, yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, habits are hard to, to uh, break for old people. <laughs> we wear belts. I wear a belt everywhere I go. Uh -huh. and, um, doesn't mean that he doesn't, but, uh, I mean, I don't know what his natural, uh, habits are. Um, his friends and families do, and uh, uh, they know what uh, his exact habits are, and, and they would be able to uh, relate more. But uh, it, just speculating that it is odd to me. Yeah. Uh, maybe he was in a rush, couldn't get that uh, belt back on. And, I mean, there's so many possibilities. But he was, uh, in my opinion, definitely in a rush, and we're going to kind of – That'll lead into our next segment here. Um, so here's the two different uh, clothing here. I'm going to go back here so we can kind of see. So we've got the, all the two different outfits. Clearly he had changed at some point. And here is the hose. So I think most of you, if you followed this uh, case, there is the guy that comes over a, uh, two times a day uh, and he'll go and feed the dogs and he'll clean the kennels. And, um, you know, he's very, very thorough 
And when he's done, he likes to wrap up that hose in a particular way, uh, nice and neat and orderly, uh, as we can see on the left. But on the right, uh, the night of June 7th, as we can see, the hose is not wrapped up like it normally would be as in a rush. And we know in the ro uh, the video for Paul Rogan, uh, Paul Rogan, excuse me, for Paul's friend Rogan, we can hear uh, what sounds like running water and uh, maybe they're cleaning something. So that hose is clearly um, four minutes before the shooting. Clearly this hose, it's stretched out over by the feed room. So keep that in mind that that hose is out there close to where uh, Paul would get shot. And I'll play this a little bit more. Is chat speed good, Jennifer? Let me know. So I find this very interesting right here. And I'd love to get your opinion. I think we could probably do this perfect. So as we can see, now defense says, okay, well, we got a pool of water because it was raining. And we do see it rain. But when I looked up the rain total, and of course it's not going to be 100% accurate, you know, um, but it – there was, it feels like there was, or it looked like there was a couple of off and on little spurts here and there, but there is so much pulled uh, by this officer, and it looks dry more towards the left. Um, what's what's your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, the walkway looks extremely dark, and um, you can see pooled water in some of the reflections. So yes, there's a lot of water there, um, and uh, of course. The uh, defense is, will uh, probably represent that's just due to the rain, but we'll see where they're going to go with it. Okay, you you think it is not or do is due to the rain? I I really don't uh, believe it is. I you know uh, I don't know if the windy conditions would have blown it under there or not. I I really don't know what the. Uh, uh, the weather report was for that. Yeah, day. it wasn't really windy. I mean, we, we get to see the rain come down. Uh, and to me, uh, just in my opinion, I think this is where he hosed himself off yeah. just to get the, the, the matter off anyway yes. uh, well, here. That and if there, if he did hose off the walkway and, and the biggest reason that I believe that someone would take the time to hose down that whole walkway would be that if you went to get the hose to hose yourself down, you had stepped into a, passive pool of um, blood and you left a shoe print then you have to hose it down and you you more than likely would have to hose down the whole area so law enforcement wouldn't look and see that oh there's only a certain place that's been washed down why and which tells csi that if you only have one part of the walkway washed down we're going to focus and see what's there because you can still go back and uh, process it with some of the uh, uh, chemicals such as luminol and things, and uh, it's extremely hard to uh, uh, get rid of uh, patterns and things that are transferred, such as shoe prints that could have been on that walkway if they'd stepped in um, um, uh, Paul's uh, blood. Yeah, yeah, you can hearly, clearly hear the the water going. Thank you, Paige. Yep. Um, some say you can even see the hose for a second. I'm still trying to find that, but. Um, now, someone, oh, uh, Davey said there's no mud. Now, that's a good point, but at the same time, you got to remember this is uh, 10, oh, gosh. Uh, this is so 8.50, let's say 9 o'clock. We're looking at at least two hours approximately. So since somebody would have cleaned themselves off, so would it still be muddy? I don't, I don't know. I guess that would be a test. You know, Remember, it's really humid that day so i mean stuff would dry pretty quick i mean but i'm not a an expert in that but so i i think that's kind of 50 50 on that um but of course defenses that's their argument they say i just feel like it would be more consistent um uh with the water as i'm going to play it a little bit more and you can see oh man i'd love to get to that walkway right now it, it wouldn't bother me i'd like to get there and uh, uh process <laughs> it even today 
It's just there's so much there. And then you got this huge dry spot over here, you know, in the middle. I mean, it seems excessive. And I'm surprised he took the time to wrap that back up. And then, of course, uh, the defense kind of chewed them out for stepping on the, you know, around the area there. Oh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of... Um... The defense is going to be um, making a lot of points on the uh, processes and the people milling around, and uh, um, yeah, and so we'll see that, and they'll hammer on the uh, crime scene process, and as much as the prosecution hammer on the uh, uh, financials. Yeah. Now I wonder if they have this. Uh, just one more before we move on to the next thing. I wonder if they have the kennel set up to where the water runs a particular direction. You know. Do, do they have it slanted to where it run towards the kennels and they've got some drains or no, is it they, more probably led to the dirt? Mo yes. Uh, if, where there's a drain uh, line uh, or something, they would have had it slanted on the slab. Um, so it wouldn't run away from them uh, inside the kennels. I would imagine. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll keep going here. Hope I didn't miss any. Uh... Okay, so the next thing we're gonna uh, move Lucy on to. Got a whiskey fox, whiskey Mike, both gunshot wounds to the head. Okay, I'm gonna pause it real quick and uh, just give two things that uh, are gonna stick out here. Uh, one is this: is just as the uh, first responder arrives, and Notice the first, after the first 20 seconds, um, what uh, Alex says to him. Sir, I want to let you know because of the scene, I do, I did go get a gun and bring okay. it down here. It's so, in your vehicle? I, I just, you have any guns on you at all? Lean, no, sir. It's leaning okay. up against the side of my car. Okay. You're, you're fine, man. You're fine. Turn around for me. I don't have any. Gun. Okay. Yes, sir. I see that. Okay. This is your wife and son? And son. Okay. Coming up, Ray. It's bad. It's bad. Check the pulses. Yes, sir. <laughs> this is the firearm you brought from inside the house. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I went get. This is a long story. My son was in a boat wreck a, a few months back. So anyway, as soon as he gets there, he he mentions the boat wreck. Um, and I just feel like that's so odd. And he, of course, he does it with the 911 call, if I recall. Uh, just something he's, you know, he's always he's talking about that boat thing. Um, I just feel, I don't, I don't know, a little suspicious to me. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I'd be more concerned um, about what uh, is happening here at the scene and uh, my safety and my other family member's safety and the officer's safety and my personal safety versus, um, you know, bringing up that. So it is kind of odd, but what happens in thought processes in these uh, high uh, stress situations um, is odd, but is it possible that he was just trying to rationalize what and why? Um, and of course, that's the way the defense is going to present it. He's just trying to figure out why it happened and wanted the officer to be aware of. And, um, the prosecution is going to say one way and the uh, defense is going to say the other. Okay. So we're going to get back to that video and we're going to look at the tracks. Um, and cause I kind of blew them up a little bit. Uh, and I thought they were interesting. And then of course we've, we've got a bunch of little other things. And then if you missed the first part where we did Steve's thing, we're going to show it again at the end. Uh, thank you Phoebe for becoming a member and supporting the channel. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Any donations uh, much appreciated uh, help support this channel and it allows us to do the things that uh, we're doing like this here. So thank you so much, Phoebe. 
All right, this is just one little thing that I know. I've heard this 911 call a million times, and every time there's something new that I hear that's just weird. Anyway, this is kind of towards the beginning, and this is kind of when they're switching over to the operator. You know, he starts with the female. Um, or wait. Okay, you said 4147 Moselle Road. Okay, the guy and then he switches over. Um, but there's something just as they're switching. Uh, it sounds like somebody's saying Alex's son. It, it's weird. It could be nothing. I just wanted to play it for you guys. Okay. The firearm you. Oops. Okay, here it comes. I need to police the passes immediately. My wife and child. Let me know what you hear in the chat. It's going to come like literally as soon as I hit play here. Okay, you said 4147 Mozart Road in Allison. Is that weird or what? I mean, it could be the other chick talking for a second. Um, but it sounds more like Alex and sounds like Alex's son. I don't know. Just weird. It's just something out of the blue that I heard. Um, like I said, every time I hear that 911 call, there's always something odd that I, I discover on there. It could be absolutely nothing. Just weird. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the tracks. Uh, okay. When did you get home? Right, um, right when you called or did you go to the house first? Where is the house? I came to the house first. My mom has late stages Alzheimer's and my dad is in the hospital. Okay. I left. I don't know what time. I can go back on my phone and tell you the exact times. Did you check? Okay. Did I check what? Did you check them? The, the, we got medical guys that are, that, that's 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 what they're going to do, okay? Well, what are they doing? Can they hurry? They are. Yes, sir. That, that gentleman that was out here already, he's one of the battalion chiefs, okay? So this is uh, another, uh, this was, leads up into the tracks, but I, I played the first part of this because this actually, he asked him, okay, what were you doing this, you know, what, you know, what was going on? Give me the timeline. And just as he starts to talk, then he, he um, does his little thing where he just uh, switches the subject. Well, not switches the subject, but Tell talks you about. Tell you the exact times. Did you check? Okay. Did I check what? Did you check them? The, the, we got medical guys that are, that, that's 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 what they're going to do, okay? Uh, what are they doing? Yeah. Can they hurry? They are. Yes, sir. That, that gentleman that was out here already, he's one of the battalion chiefs, okay? And, of course, he already told them that they were dead uh, on the 911 call, but now he's wondering, are they dead? I know uh, that's been, you know, talked about millions of times, but just, just odd. Okay. All right. So here are the tracks, and get your thoughts on this, Steve, and... Let's see. I'm going to try to make it bigger for everybody. See if you guys can see this here. Um, oh, let me grab these real quick here. Uh, well, we got a paused here. Annabelle, Annabelle Smirk, thank you so much for the super sticker. Um, he really told on himself. Happy to be here. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much, Walkie Talkie. And thank you so much, Jane B. You guys are so awesome. Yeah, he does. He's he gives up a lot of information, uh, and we'll we'll play a couple of clips as well. But here is the tracks, which is interesting. Um, okay. And so uh, that is loaded. Okay. Um, you might want to unload it. But I mean... <sighs> is this the only firearm with you? It, sir. This is the only one, or is there any more in the truck? I believe that's it. You think that's the only one? Okay. I'm 99%. Do you normally sure have any other firearms in your vehicle? I don't, but occasionally okay. there, occasionally there's a pistol in there. Okay. So odd how his demeanor kind of changed. Wait right here there. for me for a second, okay? Okay. So here are the tracks and the. Not even highlight them there. Because I, I thought originally when I first saw this, it just looked like one track coming and then another track uh, we'll see on the right here. But now we actually see two tracks. Uh, I'll play it a little bit and get your thoughts on that, Steve, and sure. what you would have wanted to done. But, yeah, clearly it looks like two tracks um, with how close they are. 
makes me wonder if those were two side by side tracks. And then, just this, in my opinion, from watching this, it seems on the left to me, it looks like two side by side tracks. On the right, we've got uh, possibly his tracks that came in. Uh, what do you what do you see here, Steve? Oh no, I agree with you on the tracks, and it's so important that crime scenes about tracks, and not just the tire tracks, but even shoe prints and shoe tracks that could be seen that as an officer when you first arrive on the scene that uh, you may not see that as you go in, you have to pay attention. And this officer did a good job finding those uh, tire tracks. And I believe he probably would have done a uh, real good job as he came through the scene looking for shoe prints and things of that nature. And uh, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that once you establish how you go into a scene from law enforcement, you set out the guidelines that everyone else walks that same path. Oh. That, so that, uh, in the future, whereas law enforcement, if they're just milling around away from a certain path, you can lose or destroy evidence. Whereas if you set off a corridor that this is the way I came in, this is our safe path. And you pay attention to that, just like this officer found these tire tracks. And then when you find those tire tracks, you have to evaluate that we've got to enlarge the crime scene because we don't know what uh, can be determined did these tracks cross a, a path of uh, where there's no grass and possibly a clear de defined uh, car track and you expand the crime scene out, you create these corridors of, of uh, in and out. And so that you don't destroy other evidence or step on evidence. And, um, and it's so much that has to be done by the uh, first responding officer and, and continues all the way up until the uh, CSI uh, um, gets there and starts their processes. Interesting. Uh, and they do, do you think they had too many people there walking around? Like, you know, you have the fire department, uh, they got the two responders. He has a one guy where he's just uh, really doesn't have anything to do. Uh, Cause I think he's kind of, you know, uh, not very qualified and uh, he's just has that guy taking, you know, a, a log of everybody coming in and out. Yeah. But the well, one thing, Oh, go ahead. It's, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking is so easy for us uh, sitting here and everything. And, and sure. it's, it's total chaos when a, when the first officer gets there because he's looking at so much. Um, is there any hope for life? Is there anything I can do to save someone um, to uh, security of himself and of the uh, anyone else that might be on the Go scene? And I mean, it's just total chaos to start with. But, you know, that's what we're trained to do and, and go in there and start getting control of it. And uh, as other people come and assist us, that we each, you know, have a job to do. We understand how to work together. And that's what we train for. And um, and so uh, they're going to be bringing those points up. Uh, but the defense will as we uh, advance and progress in the next week or two um, as we move forward. Gotcha. Um so as you can see here, kind of where, okay, so uh, let me play this. I, I just went back to show this as an example. Where he shined his flashlight is basically where the shooting started with Maggie. And we have everybody walking up yeah. and down right yeah. here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forget. You can't see my mouse. I hate that. And, <laughs> that's, and that's the point is that uh, we need a corridor, you know, it, and the officers, like I said, you, um, you have to be so careful because you can uh, not be paying attention and just step somewhere. Whereas if you have these established uh, points of uh, entry and exit and corridors that um, you minimize the possibility of destroying something that, I mean, we're here in, in darkness. You have some lighting, yeah. but it's not like what you'll have in daylight. And uh, you have to be extremely careful on night scenes. And uh, it takes a lot of, uh, um, you know, due diligence to make sure that you don't destroy. It. And of course, evidence gets destroyed. I, there is not, you know, it's impossible not to uh, have some type of a destruction of, of, of evidence, but you try to minimize it. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Mary MT, for becoming a member and supporting the channel. You are so awesome. And yes, he was. Um, I'm doing a video on that because, uh, yeah, he's there's an echo. And you don't hear the dogs. And then the second that echo goes away, you hear the dogs. So clearly, and so that adds even more time 
uh, that he has to get back, you know, check the bodies. That's why we did the test of checking the bodies and how long it would take. And even Steve didn't even go back to the car. He just called from after checking Maggie. So, and he did it fairly fast and because I even kind of sped it up a little bit and it still took 37 seconds and he didn't even go back to the vehicle. Uh, so yeah, I, I, in my opinion, there was just no way to check that check two bodies uh, in that amount of time in 19 seconds, the way he describes it anyway. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and move on. And I think the next part is the towel and um, get this. Uh, thank you so much. Walkie talkie, Chris, Mr. Steve mods. Thank you so much. Thank you. Walkie talkie. You are so awesome. And uh, definitely stick around. Steve will try to answer some questions you have. So if you do have some questions, try to save them for at the very end, and we'll try to get to a couple. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sam Lamb, for becoming a member. And get one more, and we'll get going. Uh, Crime Sleuth and GPS and Paul's video are the most compelling. Yeah. Will it be enough, though? That's the, you know, for the jury. That's the big question. Thank you so much, Crime Sleuth. Hey, hey, stay, stay here, stay here, stay here. Got a whole bunch of stuff right there. I don't want to stir. I mean, this guy's on it for sure. And that's where we expand it. There's no need to just throw up some more tape, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay, so the next part um, is uh, the towel. As you can see, here comes the rain again, and but it doesn't look bad. You know, it's uh, it's kind of light. But I I, I want to get your your thoughts on this. Uh, what's inside of this vehicle here? You are right, and we're, we'll talk about that as well. Okay, so. If you came across this, do you think that's a little odd? Uh, we got a beach towel uh, sitting right in the driver's seat there. What, um, and then if you look a little closer, uh, between the two chairs, you got uh, what looks like hand sanitizer. Now, I I think some people think that you can get rid of blood and DNA with hand sanitizer, but it doesn't get rid of it all. Go, go ahead. And... Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple of reasons, you know, I can think <laughs> of why you use a towel and seat. Either you know, if you go on uh, and you leave a car out in the sun and the seat gets hot, of course, you'll throw a towel down. Um, but then again, you also throw a towel down if you're wet. Yes. Um, and um, so uh, it being this time of, of, of night and um, uh, this time of year, um, and if the towel's damp, I don't know what the evidence says about uh, uh, the vehicle or the towels or any of that, um, but... Um, it is odd that we're that uh, the prosecution didn't make uh, a larger point of it. Now they may have, I just may have missed it about uh, the towel being there. No, I don't think let me know in the chat guys. I don't think so. I don't think they said anything about the vehicle other than that. They found possibly one minute uh, thing of Maggie's Maggie's and Paul's, or I think it may be just Maggie's blood uh, on the steering wheel. I think it was a minute but that's the two reasons that uh, I use a towel. Either the seat's really hot or I'm getting in and I've, uh, um, you know, I've been somewhere and I'm wet. And, uh, and so I put, so I, um, that's the that's, two reasons. That's not a bad argument because it is leather seats. And I've, I've only had one car and it was a Buick. Um, and I absolutely hated those leather seats because in the summertime they do, they are hot as heck. Um, I, in my opinion, uh, I would lean more towards this. To me, this is just because Alex is just, uh, just I don't know. Uh, everything just doesn't add up, you know. If he was telling the truth from the beginning, I understand some timeline uh, people, you know, witnesses get times wrong, but it, it just seems like he's always, you know, one of his biggest answers when trying to get a timeline from him is, you know, oh, well, this happened, uh, it happened before or after you know, uses before and after that you never get a time from them. It's very rare. So, um, okay. Um, anyway, also, so keep in mind, uh, the housekeeper, when she went to check the house the next day, early that morning, 
she of course found some very odd things um of course uh she saw maggie's clothing or robe laid out with some underwear she thought that was odd because she doesn't wear underwear with a robe but the big thing i think is the closet to me in my opinion so after the shootings were done uh he cleaned himself off a little bit with the hose just to get you know any you know major excess stuff off then he uh either uh, took if there was Paul's truck there back or he ran back uh, and, and it could, he could have took him side by side, but he, either way, he went back to the house. That's when his phone comes back active at nine Oh two. And it, that records him doing 283 steps. And I think in that time he takes a quick shower and changes the, she finds a wet damp towel in the closet out of all places in the closet. Uh, and a housekeeper, when she brings something up you and, and she finds it odd, you would think she knows what she's talking about because she's the housekeeper. You know, they know they know your routine, they know what's out of place and what's not. And so anyway, to me, one of the ideas I had about this towel in the car is I wonder if you know uh he had a couple of different towels and you know he gets out of the shower and he's you know gotta make up some time or whatever and he's in a rush. He still has that towel maybe on his head or something, and he grabs Maggie's phone, which uh, records one more orientation change just be at around 9.02, or excuse me, 9.04 or something like that. And then, um, of course, then he runs out, and he leaves by 9.06 or 9.07. So, and then, so he takes the towel with him. And then other thing is I wonder if he's using that towel to rub the phone and get the DNA off. Would that work? Uh, if you just had like some light fingerprints on the phone, if you took a towel and rubbed it, would that wipe it off? It may wipe off some of it. Anytime you try to clean um, such things such as blood, um, you usually swipe it over into the edges and you put it in parts of the phone that CSI will process. We know to look at those edges and where, it, where stuff gets pushed. Uh, even in houses, when you try to mop up, um, uh, your floors, if there's been some type of uh, um, um, uh, blood evidence or something that when people try to clean up, they generally do a relatively good job in open, but they still push um, that evidence to the edges and to the corners. And uh, that's where we collect it from. And so it would be the same on the phone. Yeah. And so I just can't believe they didn't test the towel. Um and oh i want i want his son i want his uh eyeglasses he uh i think sitting in the police car he has one pair of uh, eyeglasses in his front pocket and one on his head yep and, yeah uh, and yeah yeah he usually has two in his pocket and yeah, yeah. yep yeah, I, uh that's what i would have been interested in uh, uh getting that uh and see if there's anything that's been in uh, uh and that could be possibly processed to see if there's any type of trace evidence yeah so a uh, quick question before we move on. Would hand sanitizer remove DNA? You know, anything can dilute DNA to the point that, and it depends what's in the hand sanitizer because there are certain chemicals that will destroy DNA. And um, I don't know what type um, they had, if it was alcohol-based or otherwise. Yeah, I heard that actually certain hand sanitizer, if you use certain components of it, can actually uh, clump it up together, the DNA. Uh, it was interesting. I, I came across it just before the show and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, there's probably so many studies out there done. Um, uh, you know, as I came through CSI, uh, that was pre um, uh, uh, hand sanitizers that we knew of as, as what we, you know, everyone has hand sanitizer now, which is something that evolved from um, uh, uh, the pandemic. So we all have that now. Yeah. Double quiz. I keep a towel on my leather seats. And it could be just as innocent as that for sure. Um, but it's just something to note, you know. Um and okay, so we're moving forward here. And for those that kind of came in late, we will play the uh video again for you guys here in just a minute. Um I think I was just showing the chicken coop. Because we never really got to see that. So, okay, yeah, I do. All right, before we do that, I'm going to quickly plug my um, 
my liquid uh, IV real quick, um, and then uh, we'll play the video. The mob crew, how would you like to feel better about what you put into your body? This all new product called Liquid IV is taking hydration to the next level. Liquid IV's hydration multiplayer is a great tasting daily electrolyte drink mix that utilizes the breakthrough science of cellular transport technology to deliver hydration to your bloodstream faster and more efficiently than water alone. Just add the non-GMO electrolyte powder to your water and let CTT do the rest. It comes in tons of different flavors like strawberry, grape, lemon, lime, and much more. Just add the powder to water and get the hydration your body deserves. They have powder for energy, hydration, and even one to help you sleep better. If you'd like to learn more or purchase some, go to this link down in the description of this video. And if you use the code the Mob Crew during your checkout, you can save up to 20% on your next order. Hydrate now with Liquid IV. Thank you. Okay, shout out to Liquid IV for uh, being an affiliate with the channel. Okay, all right. For those that might have missed it, we're going to go ahead and play it now. Uh, show some scenes that you guys didn't see before. So this is your, you've got the drone out, just kind of showing your setup here. Uh, as we can see, we've got Maggie laying out uh, face down here on the left. Uh, you've got her in the different positions kind of uh, with these little, uh, what are they? The, they're all mannequins that I oh, set okay. up. So I would have a, uh, some set points to um, yep. uh, illustrate of where the positioning of from the first uh, gravel defect that uh, was noted by the uh, CSI um, to where the second position that would have uh, ejected a uh, um, a 300 blackout casing back towards that uh, gravel impact. Okay, so this is without the timer. And we'll go ahead and play this for those who might have missed this. This is Steve just kind of showing this isn't, you know, the exact way how it went down. This is just to show how fast uh, you can take down two people. Uh, you have them spread out exactly where they were at, uh, but you're just kind of showing how fast things can go down. Absolutely. I, you know, not having all the information they have, you just, you know, guesstimate the best you can. And um, the old 12 gauge, it, it will rock your world. Yeah, I don't think I, I fired a couple of guns, but not a 12 gauge. Uh, they recreated the uh, shot that went to the um, uh, bird cage and then uh, finished off. Um, well, those two shots. Now, this is the, um, um, I did a comparison of the uh, final shot with the 12 gauge shotgun because the expert was uh, describing how large of a, um, a pattern that the shot shell, once it gets three feet away, about how large that uh, shot shell pattern would be. And this is at three feet. And um, I have, I, I did two which I ran two runs on the, uh, of the recreation. And those are these two shots and both times were within a second of each other. Um, and so, um, I did one run, uh -huh. the one that you show is my first initial run. And then I went back and did the same run just to make sure that, um, um, it was in case of my drone footage, if something was messed up, I had a, a backup plan. <clears throat> I fired the second shot, and these are the two shots. Um, and um, but I, it is also a good um, uh, example of what that pattern would be: three feet from the um, end of the muzzle, and the choke. I, and for people that don't understand what choke and shotguns are, shotguns uh, the barrels can be constricted at the end to either that when the shot comes out, it will expand or it will constrict by using different types of chokes this oh is, and uh so that there's different purposes for shotguns and, and so it, it won't spread as much as what you're saying the spread yeah, when it comes out when you get the full choke it is uh -huh. something that chokes it down fully to a very uh small 
or as small as you can with a shotgun without uh, damaging the gun. But then you can start using other chokes, um, interchangeable. Some shotguns have them, some don't. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of the higher end, almost all the higher ends will have uh, interchangeable chokes. And uh, this here, I think, is a modified choke. And um, you can see it's uh, uh, when the expert said that um, at three feet, an inch and three quarters. Um, uh-huh. And this is pretty close to that, as you can see with the measurement rule. It's perfect. Uh, Ellie, thank you. Uh, not beach towel, but swim shorts. See your email. Okay. Uh, if we get time, we'll go back and look at it. Um, you could be right. Interesting. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, one thing I want to add on this, because I, I've gotten a, quite a few times, well, a little bit anyway, is when we recreated Paul, which, I mean, it's gotten great reviews on it. Uh, one thing people don't realize is you're you're shooting just styrofoam and some gelatin. You're not re you're not reenacting the whole face like skin, so no. we, we understand that his face is part part of his face is still intact. Yes, because people see this and go, "Well, that's not how it happened," because he still had in front yeah. of his face. No. Well, yeah, um, we I can't, can't recreate represent. skin. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't rep- I can't go out and recreate the skin. Um, yeah. I don't have that technology now. There's probably uh, things out there you can use for that, but uh, my budget doesn't allow that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, one hope, day, yeah, one day maybe, but uh, no, um, and and no way are we trying to say that this is exactly what it is. But it, uh, the ballistic gelatin and the uh, uh, synthetic uh, blood that I use will give you accurate results of how human uh, tissue, muscle, and uh, uh, blood reacts in uh, uh, when they're shot with a uh, high velocity. Um, either a rifle or a shotgun and uh, the kinetic energy as it uh, creates that forward spatter and back spatter it does a great job of uh, representing that interesting uh great question patricia i wonder if the shotgun knocked alex on his butt if he was kind of on that downward could that have caused him maybe to trip backwards well i mean you know uh, being someone that has fallen during certain situations um a step back and it's something that you have to train for that you don't do it. Uh, and it always does occur at the worst uh, situation. Now, if you take a step back and your heel catches, such as on that threshold, yes, it's very uh-huh. possible he could have went down. And I uh, believe that it's something of that effect that probably did happen, um, um, that uh, uh, either he was down. Now, it doesn't mean he fired the gun from his shoulder. He could have been on the floor or on his side and um, – the gun could have been almost on the floor or even the butt could have been sitting on the uh, concrete area. And he just um, had that angle and yep. uh, pressed that trigger and it uh, uh, struck <laughs> and created that fatal uh, uh, gunshot wound. Interesting. Okay. So we've got uh, a little bit more. We've got another 30. I mean, we still got a, about a half a show left here. Um and thank you guys so much. We've got uh, 3,300 people in here. That's so amazing. You guys, uh, it's really, it means so much for you guys to take the time out of your day to watch the show. And uh, like I said, a lot of stress. I give, I give most of the credit to Steve for all his amazing work and he throws it right back. So uh, it's, it's really cool. But um, thank you animals. Our angel, amazing name uh, for the uh, super sticker. And Okay, so this little part I'm going to play, and then we're going to talk about uh, what's coming up is the possibility of two shooters and why is the phone thrown out. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Maggie's phone and some theories on that. But uh, I just want to play this one part, uh, just one of the many things where uh, we catch Alex kind of uh, giving up some details. So I made a few phone calls. Okay. And... Where was Buster? Buster was in Rock Hill. Okay. Is that he, where he lives or? No, he lives in Columbia, but he just started a new job. He, he's going back to law school in January. Okay. So he's working a little part-time job um, with Wild Wings Okay. Uh, uh, through January. Gotcha. You know, just kind of killing time. And he was in, um, his girlfriend lives in Rock Hill. She's studying for the... I left my mom's and uh okay so he's asking him you know the timeline he's asking about the timeline uh it's coming up here in just a second what he says i went back home 
I got to the house. Uh, I went inside. Nobody was there. I got in the car. I went back to the kennels and went back to the kennels. Yeah. Now, I will say he does say I went back to the house. Could have just been slipped. And he just said, you know, I went back to here, went back to here, went back to the kennels because he's been at the kennels before that. But to me, I think that's a slip up. What do you think, Steve? Because oh, technically. Um, he, um, which, you know, once again, he goes to the kennels all the time. Um, and is he, is it a slip up for that night or, um, uh, or is he just talking in general? So, um, you're going to have it argued both ways by <laughs> either is the prosecution or the defense. Right. And, uh, right. But it could. And when I first heard it, I said, yes, uh, that was one of those slips. <laughs> and yeah, uh, uh, but you, you know, you don't want to be overly biased. You have to try to keep open mind. Um, sure. And, um, yeah. and, and let the evidence drive you to whichever way the evidence drives you. Yeah. Um, so just kind of looking at chat here. You know. And you, when you went back to the definitely tunnels, rehearsed Maggie there. and Paul. Did <laughs> you see yeah. anybody? Any cars? I didn't see take, anything take right then. No, sir. Take your time. You know, I saw Maggie and I saw Paul laying down. I knew. You know, I didn't know. You know, I, I knew it was bad. I went over there and, you know, I saw it. Yeah. And, you know, I called 911. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, great Most comments. Thank happened. you. Oops. According to Al. Uh, yeah, there's been some amazing comments in the chat. Thank you guys so much. You guys are so awesome. And now, let's see, we're going to switch over to my other one here bear with me okay so let's see where should we go first let's just pull up this uh timeline here here's just kind of the overall basic timeline arrives to work a little after noon uh leaves after 6 20 gets home at uh before seven paul arrives shortly after uh, Alex and Paul are together for about a little over an hour. Uh, Maggie arrives a little after 8, 8.17. They eat pretty quick. That's the one thing that surprised me. And then we got the kennel video of Paul and Maggie and Alex at 8.44. And then, uh, unfortunately, Paul and Maggie are shot just uh, a few minutes later. And then uh, we have Alex leaving for uh, his mother's house at 9.06. And so... Why do you think, I'm just curious, Steve, why do you think the phone was thrown out? If it was Alex, um, in my opinion, well, first let me give you my uh, my rookie opinion because you're, you're, this is your, your area. Um, in my opinion, it's to show um, you need some kind of evidence outside the crime scene to make it look like an outside um, job. What would you say? That's as good an explanation as any. Um, that uh, it, uh, you know, could he have left it at the scene? But there has to be a reason, and is it part of the staging? Anytime you have something that um, uh, of, of, of that is odd, um, you have to look at it and determine is it uh, part of staging to create and misdirect the investigation. And what you said makes as much sense as anything. Law enforcement would look at that and say. Um, was it uh, uh, taken and, and, and put there for a purpose to uh, misdirect? And, um, you know, uh, what will it mean? Um, I have no idea in the final because I'm going to have to see how the defense explains um, and tries to imply someone else's involvement by putting the phone there because they're going to say that it was placed there to incriminate uh, uh, Alex and uh, and so we'll just have to see which way it uh, goes because like I said I really don't know yet I'm I'm waiting to see what the defense says on that yeah okay um, I don't want to get off track versus but this I, I know some people ask this question uh, remember Paul keeps his guns close to him uh, you've heard his dad say that um, uh, other people say that 
And so there's one or two things. Either Paul had the blackout with him on that side-by-side, -side, which is under that red overhang where we saw it parked, or Paul's truck would have been parked somewhere where um, uh, Alex's vehicle was, I'm assuming, or somewhere close to that. So you have those two possibilities. But the, uh, we know that he kept that or close to him. So, um, And so that's why it wouldn't be hard to get the, the second weapon. Um, but uh, so back to the phone. Um, it was thrown. I, I forget the, the feet. Do you remember? Um, no. But no. you were able to throw if, because uh, I even think the detective said that you could throw the, the phone um, pretty far. And since the you're sitting in a vehicle, you're not throwing it from a high, you know, it's not very tall height. And then especially if there's a phone case, the phone cases these days, you can, uh, toss these things all over the place and they're pretty durable and plus it's landing in grass so um, the phone looked pretty intact had some i think some uh, water droplets because some moisture on it i think or something but um yeah why um if two phones are available uh with one phone sitting on paul's body well i guess uh you know alex but why take one phone and then th throw it like if you were if you weren't Alex and it was done by an outside source, do you think it makes sense to t take a phone and then just toss it minutes later as you leave? No, I, um, not unless you're trying to stage or set up something. There has to be a reason that, uh, uh, and I mean, you're leaving it right there next to the house. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not uh, um, getting rid of it. Uh, yeah, you, uh, destroy it. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, someone wouldn't think that you, you know, uh, I know all my phones, uh, you uh, simply, you know, uh, find my phone and there your phone pops up. Um, I know how to do it. And so uh, would he as an attorney know how to do the find my phone? Um, I would believe so. Yeah. 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 Unless he had put the guns there because he had set up, had he had set up to do what he was planning. Yeah. I, I think when he turned that phone off at 8.09 uh, before Maggie arrived, uh, to me, if you remember Idaho student case, Brian Koberger, um, somebody who studied criminology and all that stuff uh, in BTK. And what did he do before he goes? He turns his phone off and then turns it back on, you know, just after. Um, so that's another video. That's a video that I want to look into and look at all the calls that they were deleted. Uh, that's a great question, Tanya. Okay, let's continue on. Another question of, uh, you know, let me pull it up here. If an outside source did this, would you risk, you, you would obviously know who the Murdochs were, and if this was because of the boating accident, you definitely know who the Murdochs are. You know they're hunters. You know that they're going to be armed. Have you ever seen a case where someone comes in and uses their weapons on them? I mean, I'm sure it's happened, yes. but yes, and um, normally it's family. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, oh. that's <laughs> that doesn't look good. Yeah, sadly, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. but um, but uh, actually, that more more times than not, um, uh, when uh, family weapons are used against family, it's by family. So here's another thing: if you look at this position here. You've got all these dogs that um, are looking, you know, uh, at, you know, got a pretty good view of the, the entrance coming in, uh, if anybody's going to come and attack them. And from the way that they got attacked, it's like they would have had to walk right past the dogs. Uh, you would think they would be going crazy and alerting to one of them. Um, I, I just don't think it, you know, I try to look at it as another person being there but it just doesn't or you know somebody besides alex but it just it don't add up okay so this is the uh, another big one to me i think this is huge and i wish the prosecution would have looked more into this victimology something i learned from you steve yeah. alex had his phone off from approximately 809 to 902 on june 7th the shooting happened between 849 to 853. Uh, just coincidentally, his phone's off when they get shot. Now, 
is Alex, who is known to be always on his phone. He's talking with clients. That is his job to be on phones, you know, talking with friends, family, clients. Um, you hear from people that testified saying, yeah, he's always on his phone, the bookkeeper. Um, and so do you think they should have looked up his previous phone records to see, Hey, is it normal for him to shut off his phone for like an hour around this certain time period? Yeah. And as far as victimology, law enforcement, when they first got there, they're looking at him being part of, 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 of Maggie and Paul being the victims and him uh, discovering that he is a victim. And so, but at some point, this victimology will have turned into a offender profile and um, and it will have changed. Early stages, yes, it would be considered victimology. Later, uh, once the charges come out, it would be a offender profile. Um, so, um, and, uh, but there are certain points of where the victimology changes over to the other uh, stages. And, um, but, um, but they, uh, they're, they're parallels exactly because you look at everything about that person, what they were doing in the days leading up to the um, um, the homicides, um, the hours leading up. You build as uh, big of a digital footprint of this person's habits, uh, right? Long term, and you apply it, and you apply it to both the victims, and then you apply it to when you do turn it over into a offender profile of what they were doing. And then um, uh, the offender profile, of course, is what led us to, and for him to be charged with these uh, uh, charges. Is there any ability by asking Google Earth has satellite imagery capture a crime taking? You can get private uh, pictures, um, images. Uh, we're actually kind of doing that for Dylan Rounds. But uh, it's hard in certain areas in the quality. Obviously, it's from the satellite. You're not going to get there. Uh, people would look like a little dot. You know, I don't know. You know, maybe it would get better over time. But, uh, yeah, that's I mean, it's not a bad idea. Uh, maybe one day uh, the satellites. But uh, it's kind of scary to think about. But. Yeah, well, we have so much uh, uh, digital cameras and, and things out there now. You know, um, look how they um, uh, have used it on the uh, Kohlberger case in Idaho, that they were able to track that vehicle during those homicides out there, and um, even without the uh, satellite Im imaging, that um, in our world now it's so easy to track people and see people, and and I, it's surprising to me that uh, some of his movement wasn't um, observed on some of. Uh, some type of cameras. Ooh, this is a good one. Um, yeah, no one's talking about him leaving his vehicle idling when he got home from his mama's. Now, the only question, I, I don't know an SUV, it's got the uh, key fob, um, but that, that is, that's not a bad uh, thing. Does he, that would, I guess that would be, is he, does he normally leave it running when he gets out? Uh, I guess I'll have to look at the data. I guess it would, we might have the data to look at some of his, prior like him going to his mother's um that's not a bad idea um interesting betty great uh great comment um yeah almost like he knew when he got back to the house uh which you know he's only there for two three minutes and then he goes to the kennels okay just a little bit more here and then uh, we'll try to get to a few questions um and just I can't thank you guys enough for um, all the support and uh, everybody being here tonight. Okay, let me uh, find it here. Okay, we got a couple more. Uh, let's see. Do I have it in this? I think I might have it in this one here. Okay. I know we kind of talked about this, uh, but I, I, I don't know if I had you on here. I think I talked to you about it. But so when in the interview, uh, the second interview, I think, uh, two days after the shootings, uh, Alex, they ask, um, he's talking about discovering the, the two bodies and uh, the detective asks him, you know, uh, how did you roll Paul over? And he asked him, did you roll him towards the kennels or away from the kennels? 
And I thought it was odd because he said he rolled them away from the kennels, meaning that he went around the body. If you're just going to check a pulse, um, now remember his hands are under him. And I, I think he's obviously to get his phone and Paul is right-handed and I figure it would be in his right pocket, which means if he's face down, it's going to be on this side. So to get to that phone, he's got to roll him over. He's got to roll him away from the kennels. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I've seen your presentation on that. And uh, it is, uh, that was a great question. And uh, it is that most people that uh, do carry uh, phones on their strong hand now. I, I do the opposite. Uh, I carry a firearm. If you carry a firearm, a lot of times you'll carry it on the opposite side, um, on your left side, uh, your phone. You keep your gun on your strong side. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, I just – and then I think what happened is is he noticed, uh, one, yeah, he most likely didn't know the code, and, two, his phone was at 2%, uh, probably less than that. It eventually died um, a, a couple hours later, I think. And so – because I think he wanted to – in my opinion, I think he wanted to get to that phone, uh, hope it was open somehow, and he could uh, delete some things, in my personal opinion. So, but yeah, I just thought it was odd that he would, he's going to roll them over, you know, because I, to me, it sounds like he's trying to say he's rolling them over to check on him, you know, like, hey, are you live? But the reason, you know, that the fact that he goes around him to check, I think that's odd. It might, that's just my opinion, of course. No, I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, what was there? That was uh, okay. Gunshot residue in the tarp, and then uh, we'll we'll try to get a couple questions in here at the end here. But I I, I wanted to talk about this. So what are your thoughts on this? Um, you've got no blood, but you've got gunshot residue on the inside. Tons of it. What's your thoughts? What do you think happened with this? I'm looking at a blue raincoat about 15 feet from me right now. It probably has more gunshot residue on the inside of it than on this one. <laughs> um, for the fact that uh, I live in a world of firearms. And um, if it's raining outside, I'll throw my raincoat over my gun. I've hunted my whole life, and would this hunter do that? So it's easily explained away about the gunshot residue. Um, I hate gunshot residue in cases and things. Have I tested for it and collected and sent it off? Yes, on my victims mostly uh, to, to try to decide if it was something that was self-inflicted. But uh, that was about the only um, uh, real reasons I uh, checked for gunshot residue. Um, cause gunshot residue is going to set inside those raincoats for, um, uh, as long as, uh, until it's removed. And, um, but you know, I can't say that another person is guilty of something for something that I have in my own raincoat. And so, um, um I have to go with that. This is a, a, a nothing burger to me about the gunshot residue to a man that hunts and may have covered that firearm at some point during a rainstorm with a, raincoat um yeah and the phone thing is i'm just speculating i'm not saying that uh uh I, that's just a possibility of why he rolled them over on that side i don't know 100 uh and i literally say i'm just speculating so anyway back to uh what's odd though is on the inside and not the outside would you ex would you think you would see it on both sides inside and out well, on mine, yes, and that's what I'm saying. It, it, it <laughs> um, I, I haven't tested. I don't have the lab ability, but I know that that uh, raincoat right there has probably been wrapped around uh, in its life because I've had that raincoat for 15, 20 years, and it's probably been around 50 guns <laughs> during rainstorms. Uh, so the GSR wouldn't be anything on them. Plus, uh, whenever I train and I, I shoot firearms, I take the raincoat on and off, and any transfer from my hands to the raincoat could occur. And um, I'm just trying to be as fair and impartial about that as, you know. And so the GSR is not something I'm really uh, um, uh, feel that would 
prove innocent or guilt either way. Yeah. So the, the, I don't know that to me, it just seems odd that there's so much on the inside, but not on the outside. I would think maybe it'd be a little bit of both, but then there's no blood. That's the other thing. So I don't think, did he, you know, was he wearing something then he put, you know, put this raincoat on, but then you would think they transfer some kind of blood to it as well. I, the, the raincoat's a huge mystery to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I said, it's, um, 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 I, I really don't put a lot of weight on uh, that. Now, if they were, if they had found any type of a uh, 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 blood uh, transfer, then of course I might go uh, more towards a uh, uh, that it was possibly involved. But unless there's blood along with that GSR, um, I don't really put a lot of weight in that. Oh shoot! Uh, we gotta win. Come on, get back. Uh. There we go. Yeah, it's on the right screen. So I played this a couple times. I know some of you guys see it, but I just gonna play this one more time because some people think that he may have done this with the raincoat, but uh, I think you've kind of debunked this. Um, even with the barrel sticking out, you said that uh, if you shoot uh, oh, yeah. a shotgun with the barrel even sticking out of a raincoat, you're going to still shred, shred it a bit. Yes. Just like right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, that Parker is no longer. Well, I guess you could still use it, but people would be wondering. But uh, uh, this part of it is about three inches on each side of it, and it still uh, ripped it. But now this is the one where I wrapped it actually over the end of the barrel, and it just uh, blowed out a, a shark's mouth. But here we're just within three inches of it, though. The muzzle uh, energy uh, tore still it. shreds it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, because yeah, some people thought that he uh, could have had it wrapped up. So, yeah, the, the the raincoat stumps me. I mean, in my opinion, I the only thing that makes sense to me, and I think uh, quite a few people would be him wrapping the guns up. I mean, obviously, that's the prosecution's. You know what they're they think it is anyway, but. So with everything, uh, uh, any final thoughts on uh, what we presented uh, that I might have missed that you wanted to touch on? Oh, no, I, um, I'm with you. Um, I think as far as um, where it's going to go with it right now, um, unless the defense absolutely messes it up, I see a hung jury. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, wait, let me check and see what we're at because I have to. When I'm on stream, I can't see my uh, so we got 2,600 votes. 69% say guilty, 7% not guilty, and 25% mistrial or hung jury. So, oof, a quarter of you, um, a little over a quarter think uh, it's not going to be a guilty mistrial or something. Yeah, they've got a, a tough road. I mean, because they don't have that that smoking gun. Yeah, literally. Um, but you you said you would want to go check some uh, some wa some lakes or some bodies of water. Oh, yes. that he uh, yeah, I'd be searching every body of water I could. Um, yeah, and um, for a uh, 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 certain clothing and firearms. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. Yeah, for the gunshot residue, could he have carried his clothes in it? Um, if they're if he's used the clothes, whoever is the offender that shot Paul, and if it was Alec or or whoever, that uh, that uh, uh, individual uh, from that range and that angle and being um, in that position will have some type of back spatter on them. I, you know, I'm almost, you know. Uh, as positive about that as possible uh, for the fact that the uh, the gun was so close and it created such a catastrophic gunshot wound. Um, and when you create that type of injury that uh, separates the brain from the skull and you have this um, a massive blowout of uh, human tissues and blood, it goes 360. And so that individual would have had a large amount of uh, transfer on them. Uh -huh. You would have to clean up. And if they cleaned up and they transferred it inside of a raincoat, you would still have that 
uh, uh, body tissue and blood transferred into the raincoat. So if it's not on the coat and they couldn't find it and test it and locate it, um, it would be there, I would think, with uh, the technicians and the lab uh, uh, technologies being able to locate it. Okay, I want to try to get to some more questions. Oh, I saw one, and then the, I don't know, like my chat disappeared for a second. And I, uh, that was a good question, too. Um, so I got your video playing while I look sure. at some questions yeah. here. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, there's no doubt I have gunshot residue all over me all the time. It's just, yeah, that's a, a comment that I saw too. Uh, just for somebody, yeah, avid hunter, uh, some items that they're going to find near the house would just, uh, just have an innocent explanation because of the fact that they do shoot all the time. Uh, Uh, it was raining off and on towards the night. Um, if you look, it, you have to really search hard. But, I mean, clearly in the video you see the officer when he's arriving. It's raining a little bit. And the I think it, it kind of rains off and on at least twice that night. Uh, to me, I think it's – I mean, I don't know 100% how – I mean, the, the time that they're there, we see it come down for a little bit, but it ain't nothing huge. Um me and there's that's a, a another thing I want to do a video on uh, on those two tracks with the spacing uh, I, I know it's kind of hard do you think that leans more towards two side by sides the way they're they're almost parallel with each other oh I'm I'm horrible at guessing um, at the the, de the field depth of uh, whatever that body cam is. Okay, um, so you can't uh, tell. What range it is. Sure, um, and, that's uh, understandable. Yeah, so um, uh, we don't have anything really in to scale at that distance to show. So um, um, whenever I'm in, like in the feed room, we knew the dimensions of uh, five foot or uh, 10 foot by basically 10 foot, I think that feed room was. And so it was easy to do that, but on a horizon that you don't have anything in the background to tell distance I'd, I'd be totally speculating on that yeah um uh, i i saw the question but i can't find it so someone was asking about the tarp in the raincoat what the heck was going on uh basically like after dinner basically is we there is the raincoat but i think the housekeeper or the nanny or um, caretaker saw him come over at his mother's and say she saw a tarp. She was 100% convinced it was a tarp. So I think they introduced the tarp, and that's why it wasn't tested, because they were just showing, hey, is this what you saw was a tarp? Is that that's I believe that's correct. Um, yeah, uh, they had a tarp in court for the prosecution, and then they, um, um, they've argued it. And so um, what would the defense do with it? I don't know. So it makes me wonder, was it uh, he had the, maybe the guns wrapped up in the uh, raincoat possibly and then have the tarp over it. This is just one of my theories, but um, had the raincoat with the guns wrapped in it and then had the tarp over it. So she would see the tarp, you know, just the tarp on the outside, but didn't know. And or it could have been clothes in it, you know, one or the two and or all three. But um, she would see the tarp. And then he would dispose of what's inside everything. And then he would lay out the tarp. So she would see the tarp, but not see the raincoat. And then you would get the confusion. Yeah. You, know? that or you just have two tarps. You, one tarp is, uh, um, is thrown away and you just have another tarp similar. And you can't tell the difference from one tarp to another. Okay. Someone's saying these are shorts. I'm trying to look for some strings. That's, that would be the dead giveaway for some sw uh, swim trunks here. Um, I'm not seeing not saying you're wrong. Someone's saying this was shorts. Let's see. We'll figure this out together. Chat. 
let me save this. And uh, before we finish, oh, no, don't do that. And so you're going to be doing a sound test? Yes. Um, at, uh, sometime in, uh, I've got several tests I've got to do. But, uh, yes, I'm going to be doing a sound test uh, uh, sometime this week. Um, just trying to get rested up. Yeah. <laughs> And I've got so much going on. Um, I'm so far behind. I don't know. Uh, um, unfortunately, I can't check the email until after. Um, I, I don't see the strings, you know, because uh, swim trunks, yeah, the strings would be the dead giveaway. Um, this looks like a towel, but, I mean, it, it could be trunks. I'll, I will definitely check out the email. Uh, a million... Uh, Ellie, I think it's the one that sent it to me. So I will take a look at it. Um, you could be right. It's I just don't see anything that's giving me one way or the other. I mean, looks right now it looks like beach towel. Um, but uh, anyway, people are saying beach towel. I will definitely check out the email and see, but. Uh, yeah, I think they use that towel. Um, could have brought that towel with him. Well, like you said, it's good a innocent explanation, and or he could have been wiping some stuff down um, with that towel. Could have had an innocent explanation for it, and could have just happened to happen to have it, and was wiping down. You know, I think at least the phone when he had Maggie's phone in the in the vehicle. Assuming he had the, he's the one that did this, but. Um, all right, guys. Well, um, I think we're going to end it for tonight. Uh, thank you guys so much for all the donations and the new memberships. Uh, that really goes a long way. Uh, for those that are newer to the channel, we're still going to be covering this case, and I will be doing some videos, of course, as well on some other cases. But uh, Steve's going to be doing some more tests, uh, like the sound test, I think is going to be huge. You know, if if um, Alex was taking a nap, would you be able to hear the shots? And um, so I think that'll be a great test. Um, and I've got the link to Steve's channel. Uh, please go over to his channel and subscribe. It's right at the top of the channel. It's also in the description for those that are rewatching this show. And um, Final thoughts, Steve. Uh, I appreciate the um, uh, opportunity of uh, us working together, and I look forward to our future. We got a lot of stuff that we're going to be doing, but um, and um, I'm interested extremely in the experts that's going to be coming up in the next few days uh, and hearing their testimony and um, um, and see where they go with this and what their explanation. So, uh, but anyway, I appreciate you having me here tonight, and everyone in chat and everyone out there. Y'all stay safe and. Uh, um, I'll see y'all soon. All right, buddy. Yeah, I'll put you in the back, uh, in the back here, and uh, I'll see you here in a bit, buddy. All right. So uh, on our next live, I usually try to do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday live shows, and then uh, members uh, only on Sunday is what we usually do. And then I have some stuff for the members. Uh, usually at least once a week, I put something out, and then a members only live. So. Uh, Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, please hit the like button on your way out. And yeah, Steve is Steve's amazing. I don't know what I'd do with him without him. And uh, let me get the pet outro ready here. We got a new one that I played yesterday. Load it up here. And if you haven't seen the other videos, go check them out. We've done so many tests, and um, you know most of them are uh, courtesy of Steve. So, okay.